Welcome to the Maria Liberati Show, where food meets art, travel, and life. What does food mean to you? Tell me in a recorded soundbite of 60 seconds or less, or a post of 50 words or less. Post on social media, hashtag the Maria Liberati Show. And if your soundbite or quotes are selected to be part of an upcoming segment, I'll send an autographed copy of my book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking, to you as special thanks. Leave a review on anchor.fm slash maria-liberati and you may also receive a copy of my book the basic art of italian cooking and remember you can follow me on twitter at marialiberati.com with a capital m for maria on facebook at chef maria liberati on instagram at maria liberati and chef underscore maria liberati what does food mean to you In September, it means the settembrini. What's that you say? (laughs) Settembrini is the word Italians use to describe the fresh figs that are ready to be picked in September. Settembrini. The little Septembers. You know, it's like a little taste of September. But is that it? Is summer really gone? September, the month worthy of many songs, is here. Although in some parts of the world, it felt like summer left too soon or never came. Songs like September by Earth, Wind & Fire, September in the Rain by The Beatles, or Wake Me Up When September Ends by Green Day extol all the qualities of this very month. The figs of September are here, and if you're anywhere near a fig tree, you'll probably want to pick one before it's too late, or a few. While not as intensely sweet as the figs of August, they are still worthy of a recipe or two. Perhaps a crostata or even a risotto recipe works. I'm loving every minute of fresh fake picking from my tree and the brisk September weather. And since I spent some of my morning picking fresh figs from my lone fig tree, I decided to whip up a fig crostata and share the recipe. Here's my recipe for a fresh fig crostata. So for the crust, I use one and a half cups of flour, three tablespoons of unsalted butter, and one and a half tablespoons of salted butter, three quarters cup of powdered sugar, two eggs, and for the filling, it's three quarters of a cup of crushed amaretti cookies, one and a half pounds of fresh figs, one half a cup of white rum, one and a half cups of fresh cream, one egg yolk, one and a half tablespoons of granulated sugar. For the crust, first, you're going to place the flour and butter in a bowl and blend with an electric mixer. Don't forget to sift the flour first. When well blended, add eggs and powdered sugar. Blend together until a smooth dough forms. Shape the dough into a ball, cover with plastic wrap, and refrigerate for at least 30 minutes. Then roll the dough out onto a floured surface and place it in a buttered and floured pie pan. Gently clean and cut the figs into slices and set aside. Layer half of the crushed amaretti on the prepared pie crust. Then arrange the fig slices on top. Cover the figs with the remaining crushed amaretti. Pour the rum on top. Bake in a preheated 375 degree oven for 30 minutes. While the pie is baking, blend together the egg yolk cream and granulated sugar. After the crustata or pie has baked for 30 30 minutes removed from the oven and pour the cream mixture over the top. Bake this for another 20 minutes or until firm. And you can check that by just sticking in a toothpick and making sure it's firm. Remove from the oven, cool, and serve. Hey, Ken. Well, it looks like you're having a beautiful day in Venice today. Is it nice and sunny there? Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you for coming, Maria. This is awesome. It, it's beautiful outside right now, although it's a touch overcast. We get that yes. um, early fall in Venice. You get a little bit of the uh, oceanic, uh, the, that mist, and then uh, right around noon, it's going to start burning off. It's going to get really hot out here. It's going to be great. 
Yeah, it looks it looks beautiful. I wish I could join you there outside and have something to eat. It looks really beautiful. So tell us, I know you are not only the hospitality director, but the mixologist. And I've heard so much about you and, and your talent for, for bartending and making drinks and things like that. So can you tell us, like, kind of just shortly, but how you got into bartending? Absolutely. Um, like every real bartender, I got into it on, on by computer accident. I um, I was studying at a major university and I was um, um, had aspirations and dreams of, uh, of playing in the NFL and I uh, got a chance to uh, play in the NFL. At least I uh, got to sit down with the team, um, had some looks, got a contract. And then two days later, I got in a car accident, which threw me 85 feet out of the windshield of my car and broke about every bone in my body, was on life support for a while and pronounced oh dead and pretty traumatic experience for my family. I came out of the, the coma a couple months later and I needed to still continue to go to school. I wanted to get my degree in chemistry okay. with an emphasis on liquid solubles and uh -huh. I wanted to do an, an acute study in neuroplasticity and rewiring. Um, to do that, school's not cheap, so I started doing the finances for a, a local bar and uh, this place used to get crazy busy. And the bar owner came into the office one day while well, I was just young, wet behind the ears, 21 year old. And he said, hey, I'm getting my teeth kicked in. I need you to come pour beer and wine. And I was like, I have no clue what that even is. And uh, that was the end of it. Now here we are, I'm 42 years old and been doing it pretty much professionally ever since. Um, had the chance to compete internationally in a bunch of things and got some really cool critical acclaim from some of the biggest uh, bar programs out there and went to culinary school to learn how to be a bartender so I can really understand flavor profiles and it all kind of culminated back in about 2008 where my culinary experience kind of collided with my chemistry. I started getting really fascinated with little things like the way pH levels and acidity can affect the chemical compound of uh, sugar solubles and how the alkaline in, in certain waters or alcohols could affect the um, the chemical compound and the mix of the latter mentioned. So um, mm -hmm. I turned it into a science and, wow. and then in 2009, I started experimenting with how could I take that really scientific esoteric approach to cocktailing, but make it scalable and replicable of volume so that the guest experience didn't suffer because of time consumption. and. Uh, and here we are today. Now that's kind of what I institute and teach and all the bars that uh, that my business partner and I get involved with. And that happy, again, marriage and, and culmination between um, speed and efficiency and craft and esotericity. Wow. And I know I saw, I think I saw it in an article about you that you like to do seasonal drinks. What's in season right now? Right now you're moving into like a little bit more of a stone fruit season you're you're getting into some it's an interesting season right now like there's some bright things that are coming around like lychees and uh, obviously ginger um you've got some more rich herbs that are kind of moving out of season like basil but things moving into season like pumpkin seed and pepitas and clove and cinnamon there's a really cool saying that i learned years and years ago from a chef i worked with where he would say what grows together goes together. So what what you do when, when you're looking at a seasonality chart is every great cocktail should be built on the four T's. That's taste, texture, temperature, and theatrics. And they all need to be have a corresponding fruit, herb, spice, and umami. And so mm -hmm. when I kind of dissect my favorite drinks, I look at it in, the, in that context. Like, how can I take the seasonal fruit, like if right now pumpkin's kind of kind of cruising around, use pumpkin as my, as my, we'll call it a fruit or a vegetal. And then I look at what herb it goes with. Like right now, I would say vanilla is coming around. So I would go pumpkin and vanilla. Well, mm -hmm. then I go, okay, pumpkin and vanilla, you need acidity. So pumpkin and vanilla go perfect with lemon. I'm talking like sunny and share before the drugs. Like it is perfect. <laughs> so so I got, you got pumpkin, vanilla, lemon. That keeps it simple. And then I'm going to go, all right, well, I need some kind of like grassy notes to it. So what about Pisco, like an unaged brandy, a white brandy? And there you have like a really cool seasonal fall cocktail. Wow. That we literally just created right now in real time. That sounds like a great, uh, really interesting uh, cocktail. Is that something that you serve there at the Pure House, or you did just make that up in real time? I guess. Yeah, we just made it up, you and I, right now. That's our. <laughs> that's the Maria cocktail. You, there uh, you go. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, one of my favorite drinks that we serve on the Pure House menu right now, that's currently on the menu, is. Uh, uh, phenomenal it's I, I make a house-made lychee ginger black pepper 
and coconut cordial. Oh, and then wow. I take that and mix it with uh, a little pinch of sea salt, lemon juice, and vodka. That's kind mm-hmm. of our little playful twist on a Moscow mule. If you think of those things, like lychee's a little bit bright. I mean, in L.A., it's almost always summer, right? So you got to have yes. that brightness from the spice and ginger kind of gives it a lower tone. Yes. The and the black pepper kind of uh, stimulates some of the enzymes in, in, in ginger. And then, again, lemon juice, kind of you need that acidity to it. Uh, and who doesn't like a good Moscow mule? So that one on our menu is called the prom night. Takes you back in time, makes you feel young and sassy, makes you feel good. And uh, that was awesome, man. That was great. So coconut, ginger, lychee, a little pinch of black pepper. Another one of my favorite ones, actually, wow, what a, probably one of the favorite ones I put on the menu here is called Drunk on Your Vibe. Uh-huh. Uh, we're really big on we're really big on vibration here at Pure House. We want to make sure everybody's having a good time. Yeah. But Drunk Vibe is really cool. That was a perfect autumnal cocktail where we take a blueberry, uh, we make a blueberry cordial out of uh, blueberries a little bit of lavender and some champagne vinegar uh-huh. and uh, mix it with a little bit of sugar. That's called a shrub. Then we mix it with uh, lemon juice and a Dolan white vermouth. So like a dry vermouth. Uh-huh. Top that with some champagne. That one's, in, that one's insane. That one's an absolute wow. stunner. That definitely sounds like it. So is uh, I was just going to ask you if there's any out, like drinks that you're really proud of that you invented. So they sound like some things you've come up with or your, did you make those? Yeah, we, I did. The, the goal is we got a couple moving parts. Uh, whenever, again, my business partner and I kind of hop on and get involved with, with restaurants, uh, particularly restaurant group, we want to look at a few things. We look at conceptually what uh-huh. the food looks like so that we can parlay everything and we can uh, edify the chef's hard work. Right. And we, the experience for the guests, seamless and just like uh, all-encompassing, right? So you want the food to pair with the cocktails and vice versa. So we look at that. And then we look at what's called an archetype, okay? So an mm-hmm. archetype, there's really, there's only five drinks in the entire world. That is it. Everything off those five drinks becomes like a twist of or a riff or a rendition. Huh. So, you know, the creative process is up to the is, is up to the bartender to kind of or, or the beverage director or like in, in our case to kind of use what the chef has to mm-hmm. create an experience for the guests. So that second one I named off the drunk on your vibe, that's kind of a loose play on what's called a cobbler. Uh-huh. Cobbler cobbler's an old school type of drink. I'm talking seven sixteen, seventeen hundreds, but was served on uh, crushed or pebble ice and uh, typically a vermouth or a beer or a wine based drink. So kind of the, the OG of sangrias we'll call it. And then cobblers typically they used lots of like fascinating seasonal fruits because back then um, they had to find creative ways to get their nutritional value because alcohol in the old days was used as, with, as alchemy. kind of made sense to, to mix it with their fresh fruit. Um, so that's kind of the inspiration we use in a lot of our cocktails, is either cobblers or teas. But we always base them off of a, a classic traditional archetype. Wow, that is really interesting. You know, I should stop for a minute and ask you, because one of the things that I love that really impressed me, the Pure House seems to have its own history. Correct? It's like there's some history to it, right? Absolutely. So this spot used to be called the Venice Terrace. Okay. And they were, they were more widely known for their breakfast. You cannot beat the vibe here. And this is not a made-up number. I'm like 10 feet from the sand. I'm, I'm literally oh, right. The only thing oh. we made from the Pacific Ocean is a sidewalk. I mean, it's we're right there. Uh, surfers or a lot of uh, boogie boarders, beach runners will come. Uh, used to come over here to the Venice uh Terrace to grab their early morning breakfast, post serve or pre serve, and kind of became a neighborhood staple. And as uh-huh. time went on, uh, it kind of drew in a little bit more of a night night crowd because again, eight o'clock, you're looking at this most gorgeous Pacific sunset. Wow, um, it's almost directly, not quite, but almost exactly west facing. Sit on our patio. You're, you know, to your left, you're looking at this gorgeously framed beach by on the left side the pier on the right side you've got some palm trees and then it's just sand and 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 the pack ocean so it's always done really well and uh just under a year ago uh the restaurant group that also owns the venice whaler the uh, incomparable mike dobson and eric granick two of the most amazing individuals ever uh Uh They, they picked it up. They bought it because they saw something they could give to the community. And it was uh, the concept now. They wanted to make it very, like, friendly to family and, uh-huh. and friendly to, uh, to tourists. 
So they uh-huh. come in and get their breakfast, their brunch, and their lunch, but also kind of cater to the young, really vibrant energy of Venice, where we have this night crowd now that's just amazing. And it's seafood-centric, so lots of seafood, of course, right by the ocean. You got to. Uh, we let other restaurants tackle pizzas and burgers and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But we, tackle, we tackle the fun, playful sea, seafare. And um, our executive chef, Alex Schwarzman, is an absolute legend. Uh-huh. The guy's been in the fish game. He knows more about fish than fish know about fish. <laughs> <laughs> no, our, our GM, our director of operations, Cash Nepal, is probably one of the, the hardest working men uh, I have ever met in my life. He runs like I think he runs four restaurants. Our yeah. GM is Brendan O'Shea. Brendan O'Shea is a is a natural. He is a captain. He is a general and a born leader. So we've we've taken my point in sharing that is we've taken a restaurant that has been here for decades and we've honored it. We've honored the soul of Venice. But we've given it new life and new blood through um, leading by by example and making sure that we, again, honor the community and, and, and all the hard work that Venice has put into its vibe. That's what I could feel from what I was reading about the restaurant. And I, I love restaurants that have a history. And I also love what you said that you guys mainly specialize in seafood, you know, and you kind of stick to that, which I think says a lot about the restaurant. I'm sure it's amazing if if that's something that, uh, you know, you specialize there and don't go off in 50 zillion different directions. So yeah, sounds you know, like the food is amazing. It's a very important thing that you said. I mean, yes. You, you've got to you've got to really understand a few things when if you're going to survive. Especially, I know we're going to talk a little bit about the pandemic, but yes. if we're if we're going to survive, not only in the pandemic but just in general, you know, restaurants have like a three year shelf life, mm-hmm. and you've got to start rethinking some things. And and in order to survive and to kind of weather that storm, you've got to really understand that you are not a product of your environment but your environment's a product of you mm-hmm. so a lot of uh, the old school train of thought would be hey my neighborhood for the last 20 years have wanted again like burgers and fries so i i must certainly have to do that and that's not necessarily true what it is is how can we honor the soul of a community but give them an experience that they won't ever get anywhere else and that's that's how you create a sustainable business by creating separation between yourself and the other concepts in the area. Why would we on earth become a burger house when right next door you've got Hanano's who has one of the best burgers in Venice, but it doesn't make sense. What Hanano and Hanano's is great, by the way, a nice little dive bar, phenomenal burger. What they, what Hanano's doesn't have is a house made tuna fish, tuna salad with a wasabi and cabbage, you know, salad on the side, grade a, you know, tuna <laughs> they don't yeah. have that yes uh, and, and the owners here and the chef here have done a really good job of kind of understanding their audience and and right. going well you know what hey we're just gonna we're gonna give them something new we're gonna give them something amazing something to get excited about especially right now taking an emotional and a mental a physical and an energetic or spiritual like drain on society it is our jobs as hospitality professionals to raise that vibration and to give the community something they can get excited about and hopefully we're doing that Exactly. And it sure sounds like, wow, if I could, I'd be hopping on a plane just to come and have dinner there today. I wish I could. So I know. Put that ticket. I got the best seat for you. Okay. (laughs) I'll I'll see. (laughs) Definitely. Um, But I I just have to say and stop a minute. I love the fact that you guys are really, you know, people need to make sure they really appreciate that. Sounds like everybody there is working hard to to give people an amazing experience and i always say that i love it when a restaurant it's not just you know okay order a burger or something it's an experience and that's what i can just tell that you're creating an amazing experience for people which as you just mentioned is so important so i'll segue for especially during the pandemic you're creating you know something for people to get excited about so what i was just gonna say is um how do you think the pandemic has affected like any trends in the types of drinks or things people are ordering? No, I, you know what? It, it hasn't affected the trend in the type of drinks they're ordering. Mm-hmm. It definitely the way it's affected the specifically the, um, the beverage world is because at least in California, there's no indoor dining yet. So there's nobody sitting in a bar. Therefore there's no bar culture. So bar culture, meaning 
you and I can walk into a spot, have a seat at the bar, and engage with the bartender who can tell us about that really unique, interesting, locally sourced gin from L.A. You know, let's use Greywell gin as, as an example. Greywell gin, it was developed by a couple guys, one of them, a good good buddy of mine named Marsh McDarby, who was a, a TV show host for a while out of uh, Great Britain. But they made this amazing gin. The problem is they have small distribution, and you really have to be cocktail-centric to even ask for that gin. But uh-huh. because there's no, there's no bar culture, there's... Like you're not sitting at a table going, oh my God, I'll take that gin because there's no visibility. And Mm -hmm. all it's really doing right now is really, really hurting these small brands that have worked their fingers to the bone to create an authentic product for a guest. And now um, the only ones that really have a stake in the game are the big brands, which is fine. That's great. But how do we change that culture? How do we get visibility to these smaller brands so that we can engage a guest at a table instead of a bar and, mm-hmm. and let them know that hey we're still here these these mom and pop shops these, these small brands these boutique brands are still here fighting for their very existence you know and yes. that's we really focus on here oh that's great yeah i think that's important because i i know people like to feel like they're getting something unique yes the bigger brands are out there everybody you know knows of them and that's fine but it's nice also to know that you're getting something you know that's kind of unique one other thing i did want to ask you do you have any recommendations for like other restaurants out there you know to get through because you you guys will you know you're providing an amazing experience so i can understand why you're so successful but to you know the mom and pop and the small restaurant owners any uh recommendations for getting through this pandemic i know you said that there you can only eat outdoors right now is that correct in california can they eat outdoors and do takeout and in certain other areas of the country it's the same way i mean some are starting to do indoors but most are not any recommendations on getting through Oh my God, I've, I've got a, I've got a list, girl. You probably uh, do. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a couple LA. I'll give you a couple LA ones. Yes. I'll give you a, one outside of LA, uh, and I'll tell you why I'm going to give you the one outside of LA. Um, <laughs> so in LA, down the road from us, actually, Scopa, um, phenomenal food, phenomenal drinks. But you know what? For me, always trumps food and drink, what? service and vibe, and their service yeah. and vibe is phenomenal. It's wonderful. Uh, Pablo has done such an amazing job there. Um, would definitely love to see people support that. That's on Washington Boulevard and uh, just down the road in Venice. There's uh-huh. another little spot in Gardena, the Gardena, California, that is uh, doing takeout only. It is called Painter's Tape. Painter's uh-huh. Tape is arguably my all-time favorite brunch spot like in all of Los Angeles. This chef, Atsushi, uh, his name, we call him Sush, is absolutely He's ridiculous. I mean, his food is insane. The service is wonderful. It's extremely thought out. It's, it's a great price point. You're not going to get gouged. And his coffee, oh my God. But I would, I would look at that. There's another spot downtown mm-hmm. called Dama, D-A-M-A, that is a full immersive experience, outdoor dining. Absolutely. The aesthetics are insane. They're gorgeous. Uh-huh. Uh, we've got another one if I want to make another plug our, our little Mexican cantina is called Baja Cantina uh-huh. we turn the entire parking lot into a beach so you get wow. a nice stand the beach the service is fun yeah. the meat is insane like it's, it's a good vibe the cocktails I just relaunched a cocktail menu there the food is, is wonderful I uh, definitely recommend that if I were to pick one if you are outside of California and you are in a smaller market um, probably my favorite place is a little spot in Phoenix and it's called Bear with me. It is mm-hmm. called Killer Well Sex Club. <laughs> I promise you, nothing nefarious is happening there. <laughs> it's just a fun little catchy name. Wow. Th- their cocktails, cocktails are hands down some of the best ones I've had in like decades, and I'm very, very critical. Um, the service is insane. The, the, the music, the playlist of energy. This place is like a ball of energy, and you cannot leave there. And have a bad time. Like you show up and you're immediately having a blast. Um, the head bartender's name is Ryan Tardiff. He is a tactician. He is skilled. Um, wow. Well, you know what I did want to ask you though too. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I do want to ask you like recommendations though 
for mom and pop or these small restaurant owners on what they can do to survive the pandemic, you know, to survive now that, you know, we have this pandemic. And one of the things that I think I'm hearing through everything you're saying is, you know, an experience. A lot of the restaurants you even recommended create an experience you guys created. So is that something, you know, even the smaller restaurant owners, any anything that you would recommend to them, any kind of advice to help pull through, you know, the pandemic? I know it's a tough time for a lot of restaurant owners. Absolutely, Maria. Um, I'll tell you right now, Gone are the days where you get served. The uh -huh. service industry is gone. The right. hospitality industry is alive and thriving. So if I were to, if I were to make any sort of recommendation to these mom and pop restaurants on how to survive the storm, mm -hmm. it would be shift your entire focus uh -huh. to the vibration you create. You see, a very wise man once said, you do not get what you want. You get who you are. Uh -huh. So be amazing. So if you come in, if I go into a restaurant and I sit at a table and my server or my bartender has an authentic approach and can communicate to me in a genuine way, I will go back irrevocably. Mm -hmm. where, where, where restaurants are losing right now is because they're living in a place of panic and fear. Mm -hmm. Their staff and employees are also approaching their hospitality with panic and fear. In other words, here's your burrito. Have a good day. Get the hell out of my restaurant. I need to flip this table to make money. <laughs> Yes. And you can have them feel amazing for the entire duration of their stay. Typically, that's referred to in times of trauma. But if you want to flip it and go, I need to elongate the refractory period that I help someone feel. That elongated period of feeling amazing becomes a permanent memory. So yes. in a week or two, when I'm at home and I'm sitting with my lady and I'm going, I, I'm not going to say, hey, where should we go eat? I'm going to go, babe, we got to go to the pier house to see my friend Lulu. Or I got to go to the pier house. I got to go to Baja to, to say hi to Aaron. Yes. Uh, th then that becomes a relationship. You know, if I could tell these mom and pop, if I could sit for five minutes with these owners of these, these boutique restaurants, it is create a relationship, not, not a dish. Don't, yes. don't, like, your food is good, guys. Your cocktails are wonderful, guys. Your aesthetics are beautiful, guys. Now I want you to create a memory with that guest so that they can leave there feeling edified and enriched. And, and they're sitting at their house a week later going, and we got to go see our friend down at such and such. That is the real juice right there. That's yep. the real juice. I can always tell when somebody is hospitality driven by how I ask them that very simple question. Did you, before you approach the table, did you ask yourself, how can I change that person's life and how can they change mine? If you didn't, you're in the wrong business. Exactly. And, well. and, and, and that's a very powerful statement. That's mm -hmm. a very powerful statement. A lot of people think that, well, they'll say, well, I, I'm just a chef or I'm just a server. I'm just, I quote unquote, I'm just a such and such. Uh -huh. I will tell you how the hospitality business is the second oldest profession on the planet. Mm -hmm. and in this country, alcohol and spirit is the first commerce. This is a very rich, time honored business that we're in. And when we can help servers and bartenders and cooks and chefs make that energetic shift to understand the impact they have on our community, well, we win. Yep. Definitely. And it survived. I, that's great. Very, you know, good info. Definitely. And, and if people just can, you know, do that, definitely. Um, people, I, I know people don't realize they think it's just serving food and that's it. But now it's much more than that because many people can create just the food at their home. So why are they going to go out for it? But OK, so I know you've been called a bit of a foodie, right? That's what I heard. You're kind of a foodie, too, right? Oh, you know, in the words of in the words of my my old man, my dad, who doesn't yes. like food? So definitely, I'm a foodie. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I I really I enjoy the I enjoy the simplicity of a cheese pizza just as much as I enjoy the complexity of champagne pearls uh, uh, on top of my caviar oysters. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I love. It. Well, my last question to all my guests, and it's kind of a running theme in my show, is. What does food mean to you? So however you want to answer that, I know you're a foodie too, as well as a mixologist, but any, any parting words you can tell us on what does food mean to you? Any Food is the bridge that gaps relationships. Food is a conduit of energy and love and gratitude. Food for me is an external demonstration that denotes an internal commitment. Uh -huh. uh, food to me is a way that two or more people can have a, a, a shared emotion. It's the one thing that you can 
take that bite of and it can transport and tell and, and teleport you to another space and time. It's a, it's a time machine. Food, food collapses time and space. It's, if you think about it, like I, I've got this one dish and we all have it. I've got this one dish that whenever I've had this like a horrible day or if I've had an amazing day, I'm going to go home and I cook this one dish and it will change the very core temperature of my existence. And um, you laugh if you knew what it was, but it's, 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 that's what food, is. that food does that to you. You know, if I, if I want to take my place somewhere real quick, I I'll go home and I'll make a fried egg sandwich on cheap white wonder bread with a little bit of mustard and some cheddar cheese. Cause when I remember I had a really hard time when I was a child and my mom made that. Um, that's all I, that's all she made me. And uh, so now for me, this deep egg sandwich is like, is my time machine. And um, that's what food means to me. That's- yep, It's a comfort, definitely comfort. Ken, thank you so much. And, and hugs to everyone there at the Pure House from me, because you guys are doing such an amazing job. Hopefully when this is all over, I'll, uh, I'm definitely going to take a trip out there to see everybody. Thank you so much again. Pleasure is mine, Maria. Thank you. You're amazing. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Have a great one. Take care. Thanks for joining us and listening to the Maria Liberati Show. If you create any of the recipes that I or Ken from the Pure House shared with you today, or have any recipes with fresh figs or the Settembrini figs of September that you want to show off, take a picture of your homemade dish, share the recipe, and hashtag the Maria Liberati Show, and post the photo on social media. We'll be gathering pictures and posting on my website soon. Thanks to to my producer, Britton Rozelle, as always, and this week's guest, Ken, who is the hospitality director and mixologist from the Pure House Restaurant in Venice Beach, California. If you visit the Pure House or order takeout, send us some photos of your visit or your takeout meals. Again, that's the Pure House in Venice Beach, California. Go to my website, marialiberati.com. Keep up with my blog and the show and my book series, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking. And don't forget to post your answer to the question, what does food mean to you in a recording soundbite of no longer than 60 seconds? or a social media post of no longer than 50 words and hashtag it the Maria Liberati show. Post on social media or email it to me at maria at marialiberati.com. If your answers are selected for an upcoming podcast segment, you'll receive an autographed copy of my book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking. Until next time, peace, love, and pasta.